Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our, this wonderful opportunity for us to network. On behalf of the University of California, thank you for tuning in today for the July 2023 edition of the UC, UC Alumni Career Network. My name is Josefina Canchola, and I serve as the president-elect of the UCR Alumni Association. I'm honored to be moderating today's event focused on social mobility and adjusting to an office work culture. This program is part of the University of California wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with the information, insights, and connections necessary to launch, grow, and expand your careers. Throughout today's session, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers by clicking the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during this event. A number of UCs are known for their impact on society and social mobility, but I am so honored that UC Riverside has ranked number one at, in the country for the number of years by US News. This ranking considers the degree to which a university elevates its low-income graduates to a higher standard of living. I am pleased to be joined by inspiring UCR alum to discuss this topic. And many, many of us, all of us have benefited from our UCR experience. So our, our speakers today are Cynthia Carter, Frank Figueroa, and Annalisa Garcia. So at this moment, um, I would like to ask our panelists uh, to just give us a little bit about yourself, your current role, and your journey to where you are now. And um, we'll go ahead and start with Serbia. Thank you, Josefina. Hi, I'm Cynthia. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer and graduated from UCR in 2006, so it's been a minute. Um, but I am currently at the San Diego Gas and Electric um, Utility Company um, in California still. And I'm the program manager for their research and development program. And so I'm happy to be here and talk about um, my life, I guess, <laughs> my life story. Thank you for joining us, Cynthia. Uh, Frank, would you like to go now? Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Frank Figueroa, and I work at UC Riverside. I'm a UC Riverside alumni. I graduated in 2014 with a double major in political science and Latin American studies. And um, since then, I've been working at UC Riverside, and I work as a financial operations manager at the in the College of National Agricultural Sciences Dean's Office. Um, and I'm excited here today to uh, speak with you all uh, about you know our journey and, and, and be able to give back uh, to you all as well and, and answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for bringing your expertise uh, to the table. I, I know that we have a lot of interest and so we're hoping that with some of the questions that we'll be responding, it would be helpful to the growth and progress of, of the uh, folks that are watching us today. So I have a few questions that I would like to ask you. Um, the number one question in terms of influence of social mobility and career path. What role did your did social mobility play in shaping your career path? And uh, if you can share some examples in terms of what opportunities were influenced in your career decisions, and can you discuss how your UC education and experience helped you in achieving social and economic advancement? And then finally, if you can provide us um, some advice on how to how um, everyone can identify and see social mobility opportunities in their own careers. Um, who would like to go first? Dr. Figueroa? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, thank you, Josefina. And, uh, you know, some of the social uh, mobilities, you know, while I was a student at UC River, I was a transfer student also. So I first, I attended UC Riverside as a transfer student. So I had gone to community college. And then coming to UC Riverside, I think that that change is really important and in, in what happens with the resources that existed at, at UC Riverside. And that was the number one reason I really chose UC Riverside over other UCs when I decided to transfer and pick a school and, and the resources I had, you know, for example, uh, at UC Riverside, they have the Chicano Latino alumni, uh, Chicano Latino, uh, the Chicano student programs and, you know, a resource there of having other peers, uh, right. But also of uh, the ability as a transfer student to be able to live on campus, uh, being a transfer student, sometimes it's hard to incorporate into, um, the, um, transition of, of being part of a community and, and most transfer students are commuters and don't, are able to build that, but UC Riverside is able to really allow for that that incorporation and really being part of it and, and being 
the the big social piece right here for me was being able to get a campus job on campus as a student worker in the housing services department and and that's really that that eye opener that helped me understand uh, professionalism and, and the career it really prepared me for for the workforce because of the ethic and in the people that I got to work with professional staff at that time really showing me what was out there it wasn't just you know get your degree and that was it but showing me the ability that was out there to grow and in that building blocks that they gave me and so really you know that piece of the social mobility really influenced my career decisions of I only wanted to work in higher education by that experience that I got working with other professionals that worked here at the university and that's what really launched my career to work in higher education and, and I never thought about you know, looking back that I'd be still working in higher education. It wasn't for those individuals. So one of the things that you did right was that you really made it a point to, in your experience, to connect with the campus, right? And and the campus resources uh, in terms of really exploring, uh, particularly as a transfer student, because you have less time on the campus. Yeah, so it was, uh-huh. it was my priority. I wanted to really delve myself and get those resources and make those connections um, one of my strengths is to be a connector with people, and so I really utilized that. But I went and seek the the resources uh, because I knew the resources were there, but I had to go and find them. Um, so that was very important for me. So one quick question: where where, where do you start in terms of finding those resources? Depending on the campus, but for me, I started. You know, I started with a campus map. I started with a campus map and looked at where things were at. Right, I came to campus for my orientation and I needed to know where everything was. Where was the resources? Where were the things? Who could I go ask questions? Aside from your academic advisor, what were those resources? So I, I got a map. I looked at them and then uh, reached out and went over to places, looked at their website and see what resources were there for, for those students, for, for myself as a student at that time, right? And so really looking at that at that piece and, and, and getting that resource, but not just looking at it on the map, but physically entering the door. The first step you got to take is getting to those spots and entering those doors. Uh, because doors will open, they will open all the doors for you. And that's what happened to me going out and looking at those resources and asking. When I first wanted to get the campus job, it wasn't just because I went to the office and said, hey, I want a job. I made friends and they told me, hey, you should apply for this job. And it was kind of making those connections with other um, students, other connections that I, I, I lived in, in the residence halls with and making those connections with people. As a transfer student, sometimes it's hard. So that's really where I, I delved a lot of it from. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, would you like to go next? Sure, I actually have the same um, kind of story with us, Frank. Um, you know, I really got involved with everything, you know, orientation, you know, all the organizations uh, were there, side women engineers, um, mechanical engineers, you know, all those little organizations. And that's how I got uh, really immersed with the UCR experience. The counselors, right, uh, how to guide me. Um, I went. I was involved with the UCDC program. Um, I was one of the only engineers that went in that program. I did uh, an out, uh, internship in Alabama. I worked at the mechanical engineering research department in CSERT. Um, so I really uh, use those opportunities to build a good resume, right? Um, because the workforce or the boss, hiring manager wants to see, can you work? Can or can you just sit in the corner and just not talk to nobody, right? So you have to show that you can apply your background. Um, you know, you have those um, skill sets for the workforce, and just you know, talking and making friends and mentors and any anyone that can help you along the way. You know, there's people out there that do really want to help everybody succeed. So um, so then also tapping into the uh, resources that are available through the UCs, which are, like you mentioned, um, you know, going through some of the programs that we have outside of the campuses, right? Like the UC um, DC program, which is the Washington DC program that UC has. I know that also, um, you know, for example, some of our students um, like to travel abroad and that's part of their UC experience. So really tapping into into those experiences um, and possibilities. So thank you for that example. So the next question, how did you navigate the challenges of pursuing a different path compared to your parents or previous generations in your families? And uh, Dr. Figueroa, would you like to go? Yeah, you know, I mean, 
am a first generation um, college student and my parents were farm workers. So growing up, you know, I didn't see my parents in the morning. They woke up at five in the morning. I woke up at the five in the morning and I ended up going uh, to a babysitter because they worked in the fields and uh, then they worked all long day and I didn't see them until six o'clock in the, in the evening. Right. And so the different career path that I chose and the reason I ended up coming to college was because of my parents. They instilled the value of you need to go to, you know, gain an education because you need to do better. You need to look past this, right? And how do you work past this? Um, uh, uh, you can do better than this and move forward. Um, but with their support, and it was their support and their and their real push to say, you need to do something that isn't sitting, standing in the sun. I'm from the Coachella Valley and it's 120 degrees today or I'm exaggerating, but sometimes it does. And farm workers are working in these conditions. It's just, they want it better for me than that, right? And so I think, uh, you know, that's a, the previous thing for my generation in, in going to college, changing an education. And you would have seen that to be able to know, I'm going to attain that degree. I'm going to get this UC degree and it's going to open these different doors for me. Did I know what the doors were going to look like at that time when I said I wanted to go? No, the, the doors opened as they went. But I, I, um, I know that that happened because of going to UC and being able to be educated by the UC system. Can you talk a little bit more about the support systems and our resources that help you during this journey and particularly as the first generation college student? And then can you provide us um, some advice on how to ha handle potential obstacles uh, that embrace the pursuit of a different career path? Yeah, you know, I think the, um, the support system, right, aside from my family, it was also the support system that existed on campus. I used, I lived on campus the time I was here and there was a lot of resources within the, the, the housing component, but I also utilized a lot of the academic resources and I, I made sure I went to, uh, I was that student that would go to office hours to the faculty. The office hours are really the important part where you go in and listen to people um, and, and get those advice and really being able to make that connection to know what's going on, but also using the academic resources and talking to your academic advisor, uh, because sometimes you might think you know the answer, but there's someone there that is going to guide you and help you and listen, hey, you know, this, let's walk you together and how do we make those choices? And so with that support, I was able to navigate and being able to change that, you know, that pursuit of a different uh, career path, right? Because I, uh, before I went to college, the summer before I worked in the field with my parents, right? And I definitely knew I was not going to do that. That's something that I did not want to do. I wanted to continue. And so I, I used that seed. Uh, um, to really grow and say, this is where I want to navigate and get to this different type of career. Um, I always tell people at first that as a kid, I wanted to be a chef. And so, but, you know, navigating your career path evolves. And because of the resources I had at UC, I was able to, you know, navigate and be able to enter the UC system as an employee. Uh, and so that's how I ended up here uh, and working for UC now. I love uh, that you use the analogy of the seed when your parents were farm workers. You know, that's beautiful. Um, Cynthia, would you like to respond to that question? Yeah, I'm also a first generation um, the daughter of immigrants, but my mom, I was raised from a single mom. So I remember when college applications were due, uh, I asked her for help and she's like, Mika, I don't know, you know, anything. What, 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 I don't know what to do. So, um, you know, by my good grades and, you know, my, my, my essay and my um, extra, extracurricular activities, you know, I made it to college, um, UCR. And um, from then I had, I was on my own, right? My mom had no idea how to navigate. And so I used all the resources, right? The advisors, um, like I said, I was engaged with Society of Women Engineers. You know, I had to ask them for help or even they also had um professional um engineers come and talk to activities like this right um and just navigate my way and just asking anyone that would help because i was on my own we had a small family that had never been to college so um that was that was that wasn't easy i mean it's easier now right there's more um of these kind of webinars right and i appreciate you guys doing this um but yeah, it's it's a little bit easier now, but it it was hard to navigate. So one of the questions was, how do you navigate the industry? That came from one of our viewers. Um, would either one of you or both of you like to respond to that? 
you can go first, Cynthia. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, again, talking to, you know, outsiders, right? Um, you know, because at the workplace, there's, there is office politics, right? And when you have mentors that are outside, like I mentioned, side limb engineers, you know, they can help provide a different perspective because um, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day, um, office work, right? So that really helped um, me navigate, you know, what to do, what not to do, you know, be careful what you say in an email, you know, um, if you're going to send an, a nasty email, just think twice, right? Because it lasts forever. You know, there's little things like that that, that really um, that people don't talk about. You don't learn right in school. Um, so that's how I, I, I navigated it. Great. Thank you for your suggestion. I think, you know, navigating industry for me, you know, entering a workplace and really understanding what the office culture is, because every single department within even a larger organization has an office culture. And Cynthia talked about the office politics and how do you navigate? And it's a very tight rope. And I think for me, when I first entered the workforce, it was just kind of uh, sit in line and really understand and learn at first. That was really what it was. But, you know, looking back at it, and it was it was an opportunity to, you know, learn and listen, but also to have a voice, right? Because you are a part of an employee. And I think that big transition from being a student uh, to a professional, especially in the same location, it's kind of hard to blur because people still see you as a different thing. But then even in the industry, right, it applies to industry where you really bring in the understanding of you're young, fresh, out of college. And so don't let that be the perception that people, you know, have of you. I mean, showcase those skills that you have, right? Because you have the skills, you've graduated, you've done the coursework, you've done the internships, and then bring that, that, uh, that knowledge and be able to be at that table because... We all deserve the right to be at that table. We were hired for a reason. We showcased that we could get the work done. So we have to make sure we give that input back, right? And so navigating it is knowing how to navigate the space. And that is the hard part, really knowing when do you acknowledge a conversation and, and when do you not have that conversation, when you make some dialogue. So I think it's, as you navigate the new workplace, you really have to be attentive and, and watch and listen to what's occurring, especially as an outsider in when you first start you got to see what's revolving and it's really, really obvious. And so that really also applies when you're doing the interview, right? Uh, we were talking about this earlier in our, uh, before the meeting, and it's about as much as you're interviewing them, they're interviewing you. And how do you know if that's the right workplace you're going to enter? And so knowing before you start that first day is, okay, this is what I'm going to expect to get in and then the first day. And uh, thank you indirectly, um, Dr. Pedro. I, I talked a little bit about the imposter syndrome. Right, like, do I really belong here? And and when you know people take a a step back and start questioning their own abilities, I, I think especially as, as first generation uh, professionals, I, it's important for us to kind of switch the game instead of what are my downfalls, but really look at it from what am I bringing to the table, and and I think making that quick switch uh, will really help you be successful. Uh, the other thing uh, that I think is really essential is also to look for a mentor uh, within the organization or who you want to be like in that particular profession uh, and to have that conversation with them. Would you like to mentor me? Can I like, you know, shadow you can, et cetera, right? And so that you can uh, try to mimic um, that work and that that passion that individuals is having. Um, so just two quick things. All right. In terms of our third question, uh, how do you navigate the transition from a blue collar occupation to a white collar a profession? And if you can share with us uh, your personal journey and your challenges that you faced during this transition, uh, if you want to discuss some strategies that you personally have used to bridge the gap between the different career paths. Uh, and then uh, particularly as first gen, you know, where you might not have an older sibling or a cousin or anybody else that you know that that is a professional. And if you could provide us on how uh, some insights on how your UC education played a role in your successful transition. So Cynthia, would you like to go first? Well, I'm gonna have to think about some more. Um, you know, working 
as a, a professional in, in this space um, and being a Latina, like a, I'm a double minority, right? I'm a woman engineer and a Latina. Um, it's not till recently that I was able to be authentic. You know, I had to assimilate with the culture. Um, and that was hard to navigate because, you know, I wanted some tacos for lunch or something. And, you know, everyone's going to a nice fancy restaurant that I've never been to. And so those are the social cues that I had to learn quickly, right? Because I wasn't around that. Um, and every day I'm still learning to this day, um, just going to the um, a fancy restaurant you know, I'm like, I, for, I forget, you know, the, all those forks, right? And it's like, it's, it's just like a movie, right? Um, and I just have to learn and talk. And, you know, I do have mentors, right, um, at work and, you know, outside of work. And so they help me progress because that's, that's how I'm doing it. I'm just learning from others and talking to others. Thank you. Back on Figueroa? You know, I talk about my... So I started off as, uh, you know, my first job was brake picker and pushing the cart from the vine to the box and making sure it got to people's tables, right? And so going from that transition and going to, you know, being a, a picking grapes to then do, doing another kind of blue collar job, uh, semi white collar, where I worked in my local college bookstore and, and learning that transition of you're still in that service environment, right? And so, but what I learned and I took from that was that that service environment of how do you make things and process things right as you transition into a white collar job and so when i first got my first what you would call white collar job you know really learning from those previous experiences of how did i work in those service oriented roles and what was those skills that i had gone it wasn't that they were just blue collar job that had no meaning you know skills they all have a meaning and they all have built to my personality, to the experience as a worker that I had. And then I got to that, you know, that desk job um, that we call, right? And learning those experiences and how I communicated with managers, how I communicated with people above me and also customers, right? Because at the you know, one thing I did learn was that mutual respect, it doesn't matter what level of the total pool we sit in, we all have to give ourselves that mutual respect. Um, and so really helped me, but it also was challenging because I was so used to um, being that person that was, I'm just going to listen and say, do whatever they say yes, and just, you know, marching orders. And so really learning where there's a time and place where you can be, listen, this is where we are at and how do we really communicate that? And so, you know, so some of that strategies, right, to bridge that gap as I was progressing my career in, at UC and learning from different roles. So I started off, you know, as a front desk person. Right. That was my first job. I managed the front desk departments of a, of a farming complex and I moved up and, and moved up that total pool, but used every single experience and every single opportunity to gain more experience, learn the understanding of what each job means and use those technical skills. Um, and so that big key piece, and it wouldn't be possible without that UC education because I was able, well, you know, you know, that degree that I got really showed me those skills, those interpersonal skills. How do I communicate? Because each class I took, each communication that I did with somebody, I learned and progressed as we went in in, in the program and in, in coursework. But also, I was able to bring it back to my daily, you know, um, education in my, my daily work job. So, kind of in that, that perspective. So we have uh, actually uh, a number of questions on on the chat that are inquiring about how do you navigate through the office politics. You know, um, that's one. And then there was a couple of questions that relate to, um, you know, being being put in a setting where you might not have the the social background um, to be able to have these conversations. Like, for example, people talking about their, you know, their their summer in Aspen and, or their winter in Aspen, that kind of thing where, you know, maybe you haven't had that that experience, that cultural experience. Um, so can you talk a little bit about both navigating through office politics and then how do you like try to connect with people that have had uh, very different social economic experiences than your own? I'll go first and then talk about the office politics. And I think the, the you know, reading the, the question and, and the, and 
I think the real, at first you learn what the office culture is and the office politics, right? And I think that first part, it, but it also ties into the imposter syndrome where you're like, well, I don't really want to talk and I feel uncomfortable because I saw it still happens to me today, right? I, I have meetings in, in large group settings where I feel uncomfortable though sometimes to say something, but you know, you really have to make that it, it's, I talked to my friend, I, it's all chess, right? How do you make that next chess move? That's going to impact. It's not just for you to, to impact you as what's happening, but it's a chess move to, for the better of your company, of your office culture. And so how do you navigate? And it's about how you craft the, the language. So sometimes I might not say it right away. I'll wait for two or three people to have a conversation and I'll digest the information and then write out something and say, well, this is, we you know, we're talking about this topic and then I respond. So I think what I've learned is not to have that fight or flight response right away and, and, and response right away is let it sink in and have a, you know, wait a few minutes, understand that maybe you misunderstood it and, and see there and then do that response. Uh, because it, if you feel like that you have to, you know, have that gut feeling to have that response, it's important to say it because your input is valued. And, and that's very important because in the workplace, you're valued as an employee and you should be, you should feel that that value that what you're going to give in is going to be also important. So I'll, I'll, I guess we can break the question up in, in, in the answers, uh, you know, so I can let Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cynthia? I think someone once told me that there's a reason why we have two ears and one mouth. Mm -hmm. um, it's just you should listen to people. Um, there's always an underlying, you know, um, sentiment or someone doesn't like a certain project or someone doesn't like to do a certain work. You know, I, I've been a good listener in my career and, you know, sometimes you have to hold your tongue, right. And don't say things that might bite you in the butt at the end. Sure. Um, you know, that's how I've been navigating office politics. It is just, um, I think one example is, uh, a coworker uh, uh, jumped to conclusions and, you know, escalated an issue saying, you know, our team didn't do a certain task. And we had the emails from a few years ago saying we did the task. So, you know, he shouldn't have um, jumped the conclusion, right? He should have asked and said, oh, you know, did we do it? And then, of course, we would have said yes. So those are the office politics, right, that you know, now he looks bad, right? So started jumping to conclusions and making us look bad, but at the end, he looked bad. So that's just a little a bit of, you know, office politics and daily um, routine life at work. Thank you. And, and I think, you know, one thing to remember in terms of office politics is that you have to stay true, true to your ethics and to your morals. Um, and and then you see too much of, of something that is so negative, that is so out of line with your own values, then I think you need to step back and, and think, do I really want to be here? Because the one thing to remember is that you do have options. You know, um, you, you know, you earn your degree. Nobody gave you your degree. You earn your degree. So there's other people that might value your talent and even, even more so. Um, but I, I think what you said, uh, Cynthia, in terms of having one mouth and two ears is, is very valuable, particularly when you're stepping in into a new position, um, especially if there's so little, you know, created sanctions within that job environment. Uh, you don't want to jump into the mouth of the wolf, you know, like, um, so, so, you know, you listen in, if people come and approach and talk to you about so-and-so, whatever, you know, then. You can say, oh, you know, step yourself out, one. Or if you're going to sit there and, and then listen, you don't have to opinionate. Just like, I appreciate what you shared. Thank you. No more. And uh, and so, you know, you, you can navigate through that by being smart um, and and not saying too much if, if you don't feel like you need to say too much. Um, but again, in terms of, nav of navigating through that other part of politics, which is, does this align with my values? Then that's where you really need to like figure out if this is the right fit for you in terms of a position. All right. Anything uh, additional from either one of you, Dr. Figueroa, Cynthia? Yeah, just real quick. All the great leaders that I've come across, 
their common denominator is that they all have great things to say. Nothing bad ever comes out of their mouth. Thank you. Dr. Figueroa, anything more? Not on my part. Okay. Um, it's, let me read one of the questions. How are you supposed to navigate office politics when you are neurodivergent and do not pick up on social cues or step subtly very well? Any advice? Yes. Um, and I, I've have had coworkers who sometimes don't, you know, have are new divergent in that sense. And I think really what it is 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 having it's it's hard, right? But I think it's really navigating and communicating with another coworker. So in workplaces, I have uh, one or two close coworkers that I, I communicate with on a daily basis, and I think it's really um, having those conversations and having lunch with people. And understanding, hey, how's this workplace going? But it's it's hard when you don't have the in in the in the moment, right? And so it's really about going back and seeing, you know, what did that go? How did that have that conversation? So it's it, it is challenging uh, because sometimes I'll even miss um, a cue or, or something. Uh, I didn't understand that was what you meant, right? And so I have to go back. And so even in my own personal experience, uh, working with uh, in a workplace when I worked at, not knowing what that social cue was because. Uh, me and the other individual were having a conversation and I did not catch on to that. And so I had to really go back and ask questions and really, and they're not phrasing it on, it's more of that question of what did you mean? You know, so this is my understanding of it. And so, and it's okay to ask those questions because it's important because it's part of, you know, in order for me to be able to get this uh, um, project done, this is what I understood was what we were asking. So sometimes that's that social cue and, and missing the social cue, but going back and asking it and rephrasing it as a question, this is my understanding of what just occurred. Is this correct? So that way you can get an answer, be it by email or in person with individuals and then, or having, you know, other counterparts, other coworkers that are help, able to help you and say, hey, did you catch this? This is what we were talking about. Did you, is this the same thing you understood? And having that discussion. And that's what, I, what I've seen helps me when I miss some types, some of those social cues. Thank you. You know, there's a, a few questions regarding self-advocacy and asking for, you know, higher raises, uh, for salary raises and opportunity. I, I know that's a really tough one, particularly for uh, first-generation folks. Um, and, and I'll share real quickly my, my first experience at a job, which was actually at UCR. I was just happy that I had a job with, with where I had a business card because I thought it was like success, right? I, what I didn't know was that I was being brought in at the lowest level possible. And I didn't know that you can negotiate for your salary. And so can you talk a little bit about how you do that? How do you approach your supervisor? How do you, if, if somebody offers you a job and, and they're bringing you at a level that you think is not fair, what do you do? Um, would, um, Cynthia, would you like to start with that? Yeah, I saw um, in the comment or the question, right? Not to rock the boat. Um, there is a difference between advocating for yourself and rocking the boat. Um, advocating can mean, you know, I want that special project, right? Or I want to do go to that those weekly meetings with upper management to get get FaceTime, um, you know, just to show your skill set to others, right? Instead of just, you know, your supervisor. Um, but, you know, regarding the raises and promotion, again, you have to kind of um, like advocate for yourself and, you know, let your, your direct supervisors or people know that you want the next step. Because sometimes, you know, they are not going to, how do I say, um, handpick you. You know, you have to kind of just say, hey, I want that that new promotion coming on. Um, and so they can consider you and let you know. Because if you don't speak up for yourself, they might not think you don't want it. Some people don't want promotions, right? Some people just want to do their job. 
but some people are ambitious. Um, I got this one job offer and and they were they got they gave me an offer, but it was offering less than what I was making at the old position. So I said, Well, this doesn't make sense. And then they said, Okay, well, you know, give us a number and I I knew my work, right? I knew that my years of experience would bring a lot of value. And they had to get the, you know, CEO's approval because they knew I was worth it. So also having that self worth confidence helps too. Thank you. Dr. Figueroa? You, 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 I work in the realm of money and HR. And so I deal with this and I have learned a lot by doing that. But one thing that I did as I progressed, you know, I go saying that my first job, I didn't negotiate. And I was like, I got a job and it's going to have benefits and it's going to make me sure I get glasses. Right. It was the little things, right. Where you're like, okay, this is what I've always needed. I need to make sure I get a job that has this and this, but the salary is that other piece. And so one thing I have learned as you progress is when you're going in and if it's a public agency, you know, you can see everybody's salary, right? There's the ways to find out. So what is everyone else doing? What, what's that median salary? That's one first thing I always tell people when you're work, when you're going to go work at a public agency, that in, especially in California, it's public knowledge and you can look at, see what the previous year was. And so what you want to do is when you go in, right? And so go in and what is that percentage? What is your worth? Like Cynthia was talking about, but you got to add that increase. So if you're at this dollar amount, you're going to add, you know, going to go ask for that 8% increase, right? And know where your real number is of your worth and what you're asking for. And you never take that first offer. You tell them, thank you for the offer. Let me think about it and I'll take every job back to you. Um, their expectations just to say, right, yes, right away, you got to go back and do the numbers and already have the numbers. Not even that you don't. It's just go back, wait the next day and say, this is what I'm looking at. And so I've talked to a lot of individuals and as I've progressed in my career and saying, okay, this is where my salary is at right now. This is what my expectation is. And I always say, well, I need to increase, you know, get that 3.5 on top percentage, right? And so calculate that in there, right? right? What's that percentage and, and saying, you know, okay, if I'm at this number, I'm going to add another 5%. That's what I'm looking for, right? I need that 5% increase um, and if they need the approvals and go with that and then know where you're going to say yes and where you're going to say no. Because I have turned down jobs that have not been able to offer that increase that I've been asking for. And that for myself is a red flag. If they will hire you for the good employee that you are to offer you that dollar amount and make it happen, then what is it going to be like? When you, if you do take this job at that offer they're making you, that what's going to be on the other side, right? And so that's that concept that I, I take myself is, what is that? You know, I need to analyze everything, right? And so that's how I look at, at the dollar figure, right? It's a figure, but it's also that culture comes attached to it, right? And so how much of that negotiation are they really flowing? Because that tells a, that tells a story in, in my perspective, um, in my experience as well. Thank you. But it also pays off to do your homework, right? So if you do a little bit of research on what other salaries or other jobs that are similar to the one that you're seeking is paying, um, that gives you power to negotiate. Uh, and uh, and don't be afraid. I mean, all they can do is tell you no, um, right? And you'll never know if you don't ask. Uh, the, the other thing too is, is uh, again, like underlining what Dr. Figueroa mentioned was to really look at what you bring to the table, you know, what are your skills? Uh, are you bilingual? I, you know, um, you might not have gone to Aspen in the winters, but you know, you had road trips with the family to Mexico that builds character, you know, in, and, and experience and, and, uh, culturally, you know, you might be multicultural. That's all value. Um, so, you know, look at it from that perspective. So my next question to our panelists, um, what advice would you give to UC students and alumni who are seeking to enhance their social and economic standings through their career advancement? So if you can share with us your tips and strategies for career success and upper mobility, uh, if you can discuss the importance of networking, uh, continuing learning, embracing opportunities, and provide guidance on how, um, a, and how our, our attendees can proactively navigate and leverage social mobility for their own professional growth. Cynthia, would you like to start? 
the one thing that um, I didn't do right away after I graduated was I, I didn't stay involved with the organization. You know, I was, again, part of Society of Women Engineers, um, Air and Waste Management Association. Well, after college, they have professional um, chapters and sections. And I finally got involved a few years after. And it was like um, a breath of fresh air because they were all part of um, the same kind of mindset. They all wanted to learn. They all wanted to grow, um, grow your network, right? Um, and get more experience and learning about X, Y, Z, right? Versus where your everyday work might be just be the same, right? So that is how I've been growing as a professional in my career is just being involved volunteering and get to know people. Thank you. Figure it out. You know, I concur with Cynthia, you know, I graduated and that piece of that connection of, um, I went from being a political science major to being thrown into this administration type job. And I didn't, my undergrad degree wasn't in that. Right. And so, but, you know, that's a, a you know, that, that's the strategy for the career success. You walk into this career and, you know, it's in a, a higher education, but you, you take what you've learned and you really find those different kind of pieces and, and find that upward mobility, right? Because that is the upward mobility that you see, right? And the opportunity to stay in working for you, see, and how did I utilize that um, to really move forward, right? And so... I, you know, and then it's really looking at that continuous learning, right? Like as you're working in a professional workplace, uh, looking at what your employer has to offer, right? Um, your first job, maybe they have tuition remission, uh, reimbursements, maybe they have, you know, conferences. I want to do professional development and asking, right? How do I, you know, I'm an electrical engineer and I want to be part of that society or I'm an entry level human resources job and, you know, I really want to get my short CP or I want to get my um, any other type of certification, and I want to continue going through these um, trainings, right, and these professional development opportunity conferences so I can get the up-to-date stuff so that you can, it, it's not just to benefit you, and I think that big key piece cell is to tell them it's for me, but it's also for my organization, right, and so um, you got to leverage that that piece, right, and so I've done that, be like, hey, you know, I really want to go to this conference, and this is what I think I can get back from that, right, because it's, it's a two-way street, Right? What are they going to get and what you're going to get and how can you implement what you bring back? Right? And so it's all about a balance. right? And so knowing how you ask and make those asks. And the worst thing anyone can ever tell you is no, but you never know it's a no unless you ask. right? And so that's, that's one big thing. Um, even though you might be scared, that's one big thing about learning in the professional growth is never say no uh, to yourself without having someone tell you no. Because that's that's ourselves especially as first generation our biggest enemy is oneself and that's one thing i have learned um through my career um because even though your biggest enemy is yourself because you're just stopping yourself sometimes saying well i don't think i can do that so that's been and once you acknowledge it you know how to fight yourself right so thank you uh there was a question in the chat in terms of have you has your your cultural background ever been at an advantage to you versus a disadvantage and can you give an example of that yes um i think the advantage i i used to work in enrollment services at ucr and i worked in the finance side but i worked with the financial aid department and i think a benefit that i had was that one day that I was working, I was the only Spanish speaker. Um, and I didn't know nothing about financial aid for students, even though I know most of the generic information, but I had to translate for people. Right. And so, you know, that cultural component growing up, I, you know, I'm, I'm bilingual. And if it wasn't for my cultural component of, you know, I went to school and I did bilingual program and I, I was able to speak Spanish and learn Spanish as my first language. Uh, I think that was a very key indicator that day for me. It's like, you know, this wasn't just a, I went and was put in this because uh, this is my ethnicity and my background. It, it was a, a, a positive, right? And how that helped me 
um, in, in that day in my career, right? Being able to help another family understand what was going on and, and utilize um, my background and being able to to connect with people. And I think that's what the big piece, you know, that has helped me in my cultural background is is people knowing um, how do we how do we connect with one another, have that re- relationship, even though we're strangers to one another, but having that background really helps to make that connection with individuals sometimes. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that was similar story that, you know, most of my positions involve the community and, you know, where you have to speak Spanish and I had to be the only one, right? Either translating or trying to communicate a little project that we're doing here. And, you know, just to make them feel comfortable that we're, we're helping the community and doing X, Y, Z. So that's, that's been a, a, a bonus, right? For, for me. Thank you. Uh, you said something earlier about, you know, um, letting people know where your goals are. Uh, can you share a little bit about, you know, um, having had like a past conversation with a supervisor or somebody that is in a decision making uh, position that you know that by expressing where your goals were was going to be helpful to you? I think, like I mentioned earlier, right, that not everybody is ambitious, right? Um, and and sometimes you have to advocate and speak up and say, well, I want your job, right, one day. How did you get there? Um, so you can prepare yourself to, to see what they did. Um, because, you know, sometimes they did X, Y, Z, right? And so it's like, okay, well, how do I do that? Um, you know, these top I feel like these uh, top management positions, the people are well-rounded. And if you, you know, you guys can find me on LinkedIn, but if you look at my resume, I've gone from a government air quality agency to a sanitation agency to the gas company, and now I'm on the electric side of things. So I'm putting a lot of tools on my tool belt right now. And I think... um, one day I'm going to be some, someone's going to be a, like, what is it? Someone's going to be paying me for my knowledge, right? Because of all my experiences. And so that's what I've learned that to get to a certain position, you have to have all these um, vast experiences. Thank you. Dr. Figueroa? You know, I, I like the top leaders are well-rounded. And one thing I did notice and I, you know, working with higher education and when I decided, well, this is what my career is going to be. I like working higher education and how do I, how do I get to the top? Right. Uh, right. Cause I'm a, a, you know, you have to be ambitious and, but I noticed, right. And Cynthia's right. Those top managers are well-rounded. And, and so for me, I, I knew when I was ready to jump over uh, from working in the student affairs world to working to the academic side and working directly with faculty was I had to make that jump and really learn both sides of the university and really understand those functions because um, you have to, it's different, different culture, different people you're working with, different functions that are all part of the university that make sure that we as students that graduated are able to end that, get, get to that end stage, right? And get the diploma. And so it, it's really about learning, but also I think, you know, because um, we talked about that mentorship and, and finding that one person that you're able to talk to, have those conversations, say, this is where I want to go next. You know, and this is, you know, okay, I filled my bucket here. Um, and so this is what I'm looking at next. You know, I'm still trying to get there. I'm not able to apply to that job yet um, because I'm still you know, missing some of the key qualifications. You know, how do I am able to learn that? And so really having that dialogue with your mentor, sometimes it's not your manager. It's someone that you've worked with before, or someone you dialogue in passing and, and you just met. So I think it's being involved. In, in the organization and finding, you know, might be a high level manager in a different department. Or I have a mentor um, and he works in the East Coast. Uh, he's a university administrator. And, you know, we dialogue and we talk about, um, right, the how do I get to that next step and where I'm at right now and, and really having those conversations. And sometimes mentors come from, I met him in a conference uh, mentoring program. And since then we've been able to converse and, and reach out to one another. 
And so I think that's that big key piece of making sure that we're navigating and, and, and really conversing. And I think it's all about communicating. Um, but when you tell your manager, hey, I'm ready. And I think it's also about being transparent, um, especially being in good standing with your workplace saying, hey, you know, I've, I've reached by, this is where I want to go next and this is where I'm at now. I'm ready to go to that next step. Maybe they have a position coming or maybe there's another one in another department so that that, that discussion starts and flows naturally. Yeah, there was one thing that I learned that was very valuable that I, I would like to share in terms of uh, mentoring. Um, they, someone told me once uh, that there's a difference between a mentor and a promoter. So there's somebody that can guide you along anywhere from how to dress, how to speak. But there's another kind of person that you need to find that is going to be telling people about you that are going to not just, you know, not, not just think that you're an amazing person, but actually that somebody's going to talk to somebody that they know and say, hey, Dr. Figueroa is amazing. You should give him an opportunity. You should think about him for this position. Or Cynthia is, you know, very bright and she brings this. You should really look at her for, you know, this opportunity. And so you need to find not just the mentor, that's the step one, but you also have to find people that are going to be your promoters, um, you know, that are going to help you advance in your career. And I think it is very important to, you know, have the sit downs with with people that are in the decision making capacities to let them know what your next steps are, what your goals are um, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, and, and make it very, you know, put it out there. Um, because if you don't speak, nobody will listen, right? But if you sit down with somebody and say, hey, you know, uh, my goal is to become and and I'll, I'll give you a, a perfect example. My former supervisor, um, Frank Garcia, who was our executive director for the Puente Pro Project, which is who I work for, um, at one point I had told Frank, Frank, I'm ready for the next step. You know, I'm a regional coordinator, but I want to move up, you know. And at that point in time, there was no uh, assistant director position. And I had been telling him, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm doing my master's degree. You know, I'm going to be done. And, and I want, I want to go, I want to go for it, you know? And, uh, and I said, and I don't want to, you know, hit that, that feeling within our organization, the way it is right now. And he actually created an assistant director position that then led to my current director position. And so if I had never had that conversation with him, I might still be a regional coordinator, you know, years and, you know, where I was years ago. And so uh, again, it's important. There was a question in the chat uh, where uh, one of our of our attendees is saying, "What if you if you hit that that feeling? What if you know there's no room to grow?" And can you please respond to that, Cynthia? Yeah, I think again you need to speak up and say, "Is there room for grow to grow?" Um, mm -hmm. Actually, they might make a position like you mentioned, right? Or they might make the position a higher grade than what you currently are in. Um, so there's always wiggle room for sure. And if it's if they say no, then if you really are ambitious to, it's time to move on and, and grow and continue to grow. Thank you. Dr. Figueroa? I've been there. Right. And it's, you know, you get to a place where you're just kind of, this is where you're going to stay. And, you know, in their perspective, you, you're doing what you need to do, but we're not going to give you something else. And so when you know you've reached that, right, it's, it's a, uh, you know, and I, and you have that conversation with yourself, with your, with your partner, with your spouse, with your coworker and say, Hey, you know, I think I'm ready for that next job. And you start looking for those next jobs. And it's about, you know, being ready because you know when you're ready and it's looking for what's next right you don't want to jump to something that's just gonna be like a, a small um what is that next job that's going to be invigorating it's going to learn um but you're also going to feel and feel fulfilled um because it's not going to be easy because it can't be easy because if it's easy then it's the same job again um so i think it's looking at that and as much as we want to stay in our same organization um it's about moving into that next you know, maybe like Cynthia says, she moved out to the next, uh, uh, a whole other company, right? And so how do we move and move forward, right? Into that next role and how do we feel fulfilled? And so for me, you know, and sometimes, 
you might jump to this other job and it's not what you expected and it's okay um in today's workplace i think um you might get there and you're like well i didn't it's, it's not what i expected and then you move on to the next thing again because it's it's fine right and i think that's one uh, a big um um trying to find the word uh kind of um taboo of oh we need to stay at a workplace right but it's like what happens if it's not the right place for you it's not it's toxic or it's different so you know you might be full here and then you go to another place that doesn't fill that bucket as much as you thought right so um is my two um uh, my colleagues thank you so much um both of you have done such a beautiful job at responding um to these questions and uh and we're very grateful that you're passing on this wisdom to to all of our attendees. Um, we're almost at the closing time, but I wanted to see if, if either one of you had some final words of wisdom, uh, advice, or insights that you would like to share with the uh, people that are joining us today. So, Dick, can we start with you? Yeah, let's go. Um, I think staying humble and, you know, Again, the two ears and the mouth can go a long way. Um, you know, I, to this day, I don't know all the answers to work, right? But I will try to find it and I will, you know, work on it. And that's the attitude that I have and that's gotten me to where I am. Um, and just network. You know, you have your alumni network, you have your associations, your nonprofits, just network. And your brand that you create of yourself lasts your career. I had my first job 16, 17 years ago. And my boss, my original boss, reached out to me for a job. So that goes with you and carries with you. So as long as you have some good positive from the beginning, it should help progress in you and follow you in your career. Thank you. Dr. Figueroa? Go back to my analogy about the seed, right? And so we're a seed and we keep growing, right? But we have to remember to water the seed and take care of ourselves. And I think that's a big piece in today's workplace is making sure we're taking care of ourselves, our mental health and, and peace, right? And, and making sure when we're, that we're doing okay, right? So we have to remember about ourselves. Sometimes we can get in, engulfed by work and we get you know, in the work thing, but really looking at that. And, and, you know, I think one thing I would tell myself, my young professional self would be, it's going to be okay. It's not going to be easy, but you have to proceed and go through that challenge and, and learn from every single mistake you make. Right. And so I think that that's very key as we progress and converse. And I think it's being, it's being your true authentic self at the workplace and being who you are, um, and just being able to communicate and making those relationships. Um, sometimes not all relationships in the workplace are going to work, right? And you might create some great work friendships, work friendships, and some they're just going to be transactional and it's understanding that, right? And knowing how do you proceed and grow uh, because you never know that one person you interact with five, six years from now is going to come back and say, hey, I remember you. I remember your work ethic. Um, I have this job opening. Do you want to come over? And apply and so i think that's one thing I, I i stay true to myself is being who i am and this is a funny joke but i always tell people i'm always frank with people uh because i'm always direct and it's just being honest and uh, that's one thing that you know i'll leave you with thank you so much well on behalf of the university of california thank you all for joining us today for the uc alumni career network webinar it was a pleasure to connect with each and every one of you we appreciate you being available to be part of today's event and hope that you can get some, gain some valuable advice to help advance your career. We really hope for the best for you. Uh, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their time, generosity, and commitment to the University of California. So thank you, Dr. Figueroa. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Uh, the insights and advice you gave us today uh, really made us uh, especially proud to be part of this UC community and UCR in particular. I hope you will take a few minutes to provide some feedback on today's events. Um, we really want to build on, on the programming. And uh, by following the survey, Gizmo, a uh, link that appeared on your screen when you launched this webinar. 
Uh, your feedback will be used to help determine topics for future sessions. Um, in addition to the many uh, ways that alumni can give back, we invite you to sign up as alumni advocates for You Can at the UC Advocacy Network. The link is in the chat. Uh, also, You Can is a digital grassroots community that focuses on issues that matter to the University of California staff, students, alumni, faculty, and, and more. You Can advocates speak out in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. by helping the UC through actions like signing petitions or tweeting their support or email their elected officials. All of the helps shape the way that things work for the people in the University of California and California and beyond. By signing up, you will be alerted when they take action and give resources and templates to take those actions. And it's very, very easy to sign up. We hope to see you again next month for our UC Alumni Career Network a webinar focused on professional etiquette post-pandemic and for those in the Silicon Valley area. We hope to see you Thursday, August the 24th for an in-person UC Alumni Career Fair. Please visit ucal.us. Uh, slash back ACN for further details on upcoming episodes. Again, thank you for joining us. We wish you the best and continue to move forward and onward. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.